What's wrong with the New York Giants defense? We'll try to figure that out next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode of the Locked on Giants podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Traina, P-Train, and a special shout out to my everydayers, my subtexters, and everybody in between. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every day, or if you watch on YouTube, your first watch every day. And on today's Locked on Giants podcast, we've got a busy show for you today. I'm going solo. And amongst the things we're going to talk about is what's wrong with the New York Giants defense? You know, the defense, you know, they've looked kind of sluggish coming out of the gate these last two games. So we'll kind of look at what's going on there. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about the big break the Giants caught with Saquon Barkley and why that is a break, even though Barkley is, you know, going to be sidelined for, you know, the short term. And then the big question a lot of you asked me to cover is who exactly was calling plays on offense for the Giants against the Arizona Cardinals in the second half of the game. So I'm going to try and answer all that for you on today's program. Thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. Or if you watch on YouTube again, your first watch of the day. Let's get started. All right. A couple of surprising stats. Um We're going to start off with the fact that the Giants defense is one of eight teams without an interception. They are the only defense in the NFL as of this recording that um, don't have a sack. Hard to believe, right? When we thought the pass rush was upgraded. They are currently 26th against the run, allowing 136.5 yards per game against the run, which comes out to 4.63 yards per attempt which is 24th on the run defense now if you remember folks one of the top priorities for this giants defense was to upgrade the run defense which last year just wasn't very good it was a problem yet through two games the giants run defense has been gashed so what's going on with the run defense what's going on with the defense in general why aren't the plays coming You know, if you thought that the Giants defense as a whole looks like they're playing maybe a step or two out of sorts, you're probably not imagining it. I know I thought the same thing. So let's talk about some of the things that might be going on with this Giants run defense. The first thing, I question how well these guys are getting off their blocks. You know, I watch, you know, the scrum in the middle of the field, you know, especially against the run. I don't see guys getting off blocks as quickly as they need to. And when you have a situation like what we had this past weekend with Arizona, where your safety or any member of your defensive backfield, for that matter, is your leading tackler on the team, that means the front seven ain't getting it done, right? That means that the running game is getting to that second level and beyond. That's a problem. The Giants defense, not playing fast. They're just not flying to the ball. You know, um, sometimes it looks like Bobby Okereke might be a hair too late with his reaction time. It's almost like, you know, is is he still trying to develop a comfort level in that defense? And it's not just Okereke. Um, I was absolutely blown away by, by a couple of stats here. In the Cardinals game, Leonard Williams did not dent the stat sheet. Okay. Um, Raheem Nunez Roches, who was, who was brought in for depth behind Dexter Lawrence and, and Leonard Williams, did not dent the stat sheet. How does that happen, guys? Leonard Williams is supposed to be, you know, one of your best defensive linemen, and he doesn't dent the stat sheet. I mean, did anybody see Leonard Williams really influence a whole lot of plays? Maybe towards the end, he, he, 
tried to get some pressure on. And, you know, I think he might have gotten some pressure, but he wasn't credited on the stat sheet. But Leonard Williams had a quiet game last week, Sunday, I mean. He had a quiet game against the Cowboys. That's concerning. Leonard Williams coming into this year had slimmed down, and he's played a lot of snaps over his career. I got to wonder if he is slowing down. And, you know, I think the proof is kind of in the pudding with Leonard Williams. The fact that the Giants, who needed salary cap space and probably could have gotten a whole lot of it if they had done something with Leonard Williams' contract and his $32.5 million cap hit, they're not touching that deal because it's pretty clear to me that they may want to move on from him after this year. So Leonard Williams basically has been kind of invisible for the Giants. Um, like I said, Joaquin Nunes Roches, I don't know if he's still ailing from what you know he had going on in the summertime, but he didn't dent the stat sheet. Um, Ashawn Robinson, I thought, played well. Um, he's, he's had some impact plays against the run showing some instincts but they're just not getting a lot up front from their front seven now uh the cardinals rushed for 151 yards on 29 carries it's 5.2 yards per carry you're not gonna have a whole lot of success if you're allowing the opponent to gain half of the yards they need with the run so the, if they're running on first down and they're picking up over five yards per carry, you're making their job easier. So the Giants, they they, they just got to get better at this. I, you know, guys aren't getting off blocks. They're just not, you know, they're a tick too late. Maybe they'll settle down with more reps and, you know, people will say, well, you know, they didn't play together a whole lot in the off in the uh, preseason. A mistake, in my opinion, by the way. I felt that they should have played a little bit more especially when you have new pieces. And even though, you know, those new pieces are veterans, if it's a different style of defense or offense, you know, whatever the case may be, get those guys some more reps. You know, it, I, I just felt like the Giants put a heavy emphasis on keeping guys healthy, which I understand given their past injury issues. But in doing so, did they get them enough work, quality reps in game situations where the speed just cannot be replicated in practice, no matter what, what a team does. I don't know that they did, folks. And we're seeing it early on in the season. I mean, this defense has got to pick it up. Um, another guy who has basically been kind of invisible, and this is kind of surprising, Kayvon Thibodeau. I don't think I've seen him, you know, really make a whole lot of plays. Now, I'm not going to call the kid a bust. I know a lot of people out there are starting to think, oh, he's a bust, you know. No, I don't think Kayvon Thibodeau is a bust. I'm perplexed by his slow start, however. You know, he, he just, I, I watch him on film, and he looks like he's slow coming off the ball and a tick too late in, in getting to the quarterback and influencing it. So, again, you know, just overall, and I know this question was raised with regards to the offensive line, and did the offensive line get enough snaps in the preseason. And I look at this Giants defense and how they're not playing super fast. And I question if there's still a little bit more thinking going on than there should be. You know, are they, you know, and, and again, there is no substitution, ladies and gentlemen, for live reps in a game, even though they're preseason and they don't, you know, the, the results don't count. So in practice, Yes, you can try to replicate the speed, but what you're not replicating is the tackling and the tempo, right? Because coaches have a controlled environment. They basically tell the players, don't put guys on the ground. Don't hit the quarterback. Don't tackle the running back. Don't you think that if you're telling guys, okay, you know, pull up, if you're getting close to the quarterback, don't touch the quarterback, that that could potentially disrupt a defender's timing, that maybe it takes a little time for them to get that back. I think that's certainly possible. So, you know, when people say, oh, Thibodeau is just a bust, he's not doing anything. I say, let's give him another, you know, uh, another couple of games or so. 
maybe get that get his sea legs underneath him. Same thing for the defense. But one thing's for sure, ladies and gentlemen, Giants defense hasn't looked sharp. And I kind of got lost in the shuffle of the week one 40 to nothing loss to the Cowboys when the offense was just putrid. I think we saw a little bit more of it in week two against the Cardinals, against a Cardinals team that just isn't very good. So we may see a little bit more of it again against the 49ers who do have a very good team. Hopefully, though, the Giants, as as they go on here, the defense starts to gel a little bit quicker and starts to play a lot faster because right now that unit, to my eyes at any rate, is just not playing fast enough and they're missing out on opportunities. They're not making the plays. They're they're just, you know, it, it looks like they're still in preseason mode is what it looks like to me. So we'll see if they can turn it around because, you know, they, they've got some key football games coming up where they have to start stepping it up. But uh, right now, that's a very early concern of mine that hopefully gets resolved. All right, coming up next, the Giants dodge a major, major bullet with Saquon Barkley. I'll tell you why right after this. Hey, Giant fans, you never know when the unexpected is going to pop up, causing you or a loved one to fall ill. But now you don't need to be caught unprepared when you have Jace Medical. This doctor-created, doctor-recommended services Jace Case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a Jace Case is to fill out a simple online form and, in some cases, jump on a quick call with one of their board-certified physicians. You'll then get prescriptions and life-saving medication delivered straight to your door. Jace handles everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. And now you can save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical. Plus, get an additional $20 off by using the promo code LOCKEDON at checkout at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Hey, Giant fans, get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. Their app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. You got me, P Train, Patricia Traina, and uh, we're just talking about the Giants as we always do every day here on the Locked On Giants podcast, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So thank you so much for tuning in. The Giants dodged a big, big, big bullet with Saquon Barkley. Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. So test results on Saquon Barkley came back. He had an MRI on Monday after spraining his ankle in the uh, the, the win against the Cardinals on, I think, the last minute and a half of the game. And I remember seeing on my Twitter timeline and my Instagram timeline, everybody was like, oh, my God, it's a high ankle sprain. Their Giants are screwed. He's done. He's done. And I kept telling people, chill out and wait. And the reason why I was saying that, folks, is that after the game, um, I had heard that Barkley, you know, yes, he was limping. Yes, his ankle was swollen, but he wasn't in a boot. He wasn't on crutches. And those two things right there, if he had been in a boot or on crutches, then I might have said, okay, maybe it is a high ankle sprain. But that he didn't have those two things or any kind of walking aid gave me reason to hope that maybe his he avoided a high ankle sprain. And that is what the tests apparently proved, according to the NFL Network, according to uh, ESPN. Barkley suffered a regular ankle sprain, is going to miss three weeks. So that right there is, is dodging a bullet. But there's another bullet the Giants dodged with Barkley. And that is, even though he's not going to play this week, 
The Giants have 11 days between their week three game against the 49ers and their Monday night game against the Seattle Seahawks, that, that game being a home game. All right. So you've got this week that Barkley will not play. Then you've got all of next week where, again, you won't have a game until the Monday night game. Now, this is a long shot, but with a little luck and, prop and, and intensive rehab, it's possible Barkley could be ready for the October 8th game against the Dolphins. I think it's more likely, though, that we could see Barkley back in time for the Buffalo Bills game on the 15th. That is a, um, that's a Sunday night game. They're scheduled to be a Sunday night game just to give him, you know, optimal time to, to get his rehab in and just, you know, take care of that ankle. So basically we're not talking, I don't think a whole lot of time that Barkley is potentially going to miss unless of course there is a setback in the rehab. Now, just one other thing I've got to say about this Barkley situation, I kind of feel for him. All right. Barkley, was playing on the modified franchise tag, decided to gamble on himself, that he would stay healthy, and this happened. And I remember saying, and also writing this over on Giants Country, that if Barkley had to miss any time whatsoever due to an injury, I wasn't so sure that the Giants would maybe uh, look to bring him back after this year. I'm standing by that. I mean, Barkley is still a very good player. He could still help out in offense, but you've got to look at the injury history. All right. Last year, he got lucky, did not miss any time due to injury. For him to gamble that that would happen a second year in a row, that was just a mighty big gamble to take. I feel for him in a way, but at the same time, you know, he had a choice whether or not to accept the contract offers that were on the table and he chose not to for whatever the reason. So I just, you know, this is down the line, obviously, you know, the giants will have to go through the song and dance with Barkley again, but I wonder if perhaps this might be it for Barkley, as far as this being his last year, will the giants look to move on from him? Because, you know, now he's been injured in just about every year, except for his rookie season and of course, for last year. So, you know, guy's not getting any younger, obviously. He's got an injury history. Injuries are not the player's fault, but they do factor into whether or not a team retains a talent. And, you know, running backs, people say they're a dime a dozen. I don't know that, you know, Saquon Barkley talent is a dime a dozen, but Certainly not what you wanted to see happen to Saquon Barkley. He's just too valuable. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they fill that gap. You know, they're, they're going to have Matt Breida, who's the backup running back. He's going to take the lion's share. Gary Brightwell, and I suspect Eric Gray might get some snaps. Daniel Jones now may have an increase in some of his design runs. Uh, which I really don't want to see, but you know maybe that's that's another way they they go about it. Um, how much more creative can the coaches get with that running game? You know the run blocking by the offensive line not too bad, but you know the Giants' running game hasn't really taken off the way you know it's capable of taking off. And now you remove Barkley from the equation, and it's just going to be interesting because now that's one less guy they've got to account for. So what's going to be the trickle down of that? So bottom line, folks, I do feel for Barkley because I know how hard he worked. I know how excited he was, how locked in he was to have a heck of a season, a better season than he had last year so that he earned that payday that he's looking for. I just don't know that it's going to come from the Giants. I know this is early. It's only week three of the season. but. And talking to people, we all felt that if he suffered any kind of injury that caused him to miss any multiple time, that could potentially put a dent into, you know, his, his chances of getting a big contract from this team. 
So bottom line, I wish Saquon well. I hope he makes a quick recovery and, you know, goes on and explodes and has, has himself a heck of a year. But if, you know, the NFL is a production-based business and the numbers aren't what they were last year, regardless of the reason, I think he's facing an uphill battle, which is too bad. It really is, but it is what it is. So, all right, coming up next, who was calling plays on offense? I'm going to try and answer that question for you right after this. Hey, Giant fans, if you're looking for a fun and different way to play fantasy football this season, you need to check out Prize Picks. Just pick two or more players, predict their stats, and sit back and see how they perform. It takes less than 60 seconds to make an entry, and best of all, you can turn a few bucks into some nice cash with the right projections. Prize Picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app known for its quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and wide selection of players and stat types. And they offer weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday, when each Tuesday, Price Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% off to provide even more value. So what are you waiting for? Go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the promo code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. That's pricepicks.com slash locked on NFL. And that promo code is locked on NFL for your first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. You got P-Train, Patricia Trana here, and we are talking New York Giants like we do every day on the Locked on Giants podcast. Coming at you five days a week, Monday through Friday. And coming up on the Locked on Giants podcast this week, um, I will have, obviously, uh, crossover Thursday on Thursday. Brian Peacock of Locked on 49ers and I will be breaking down the Giants 49ers game Thursday night for Thursday night. And that show will drop on Thursday at just after midnight, like all my shows do. Um, then on Friday, David Turner and I will hopefully be back together um, talking about the game. I've got to see how that kind of works out though. I may have to do that, that review solo, which if I do not a big deal, I've done solos before. Um, and then I'm trying to schedule an interview for you for Wednesday. I've got a former NFL player I'm trying to connect with. Um, so hopefully that'll happen. Also, as a reminder to my subtext folks, get your questions into me. Just go to any of the private videos that I've posted. The link on how to submit your questions is in the show notes. So please send that to me. And I will do a video for you as I've been doing every week of special Q&A just for you subtext folks. So um, that's what's coming up on the Locked on Giants podcast. All right, now let's talk about who was calling plays for the New York Giants in the second half of Sunday's game. Now this whole thing, just for those of you who may have missed it or aren't aware of what happened, this all got started because head coach Brian Dable was spotted by, on, on the sideline by the TV cameras holding a play card. And not only was he holding a play card, but there were times when he was putting the play card up to his mouth to cover his mouth, like a play caller would, you know, so that somebody can't read lips. So that got people talking. Oh my God, the Giants, they did nothing for the first half of the game. They were shut out. Dable took control of the play calling. So Dable was asked about that by reporters after the game. He was also asked about that again on Monday. Well, I'm actually, check that. Daniel Jones was asked about that on Monday, who was calling the plays for him. And both of them said it was Kafka calling the plays. So what was going on? Was it a denial? What exactly was happening? Now, Dable, in his answer to the media when he was initially asked about the play calling, said that he talks to you know, the, the different coordinators throughout the course of a game to kind of, you know, tap into what they're doing or what they're thinking of doing. Was Dable calling plays on offense? I don't think that was necessarily the case. Here's what I think happened. And before I tell you what I think happened, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight here, you've got to understand how the head coach's um, headset works. The head coach gets a master headset, 
which means that he can flip channels around and he can talk to, you know, the offensive coordinator. He could talk to the defensive coordinator, the special teams coordinator, the people up in the booth. He's got multiple channels that all he has to do is just flip buttons around. Now he could either listen in on conversations or he could just part you know, participate in conversations. So I believe that Dable, as is his right, by the way, as is part of his job, by the way, might have been having a little bit more interaction with, with Kafka. Not so much to, to call the plays. I don't think that's what was going on. What I think was happening, based on the evidence that I could gather, and I went back and I watched you know, the TV broadcast on this, I question as to whether or not Dable maybe suggested a different part of the playbook, you know, like, hey, why don't we try opening it up more? Why don't we try, you know, doing this or versus that? You know, this is what I'm seeing. And quite honestly, folks, you know, a lot of people are, are, are saying, oh, my God, Kafka's lost his magic. I don't think that's the case. I really don't. I think it's a case of a collaborative effort, you know, um, if. First off, Dable was never going to come right out, even if he was calling the place. He's, he was never going to come right out and throw Kafka under the bus like that. It just wasn't happening. Daniel Jones, who was asked about it, wasn't going to throw Kafka under the bus. But I do think that Kafka, that excuse me, that Dable was a little bit more um, involved with the uh, the offensive philosophy and how the flow went. Not to the point of where he was calling the plays, but more to the point of, hey, let, why don't we think about doing this as opposed to what we were doing? You know, maybe deviating off a script or just, you know, trying something different just to shake things up, just to get a spark. And the bottom line is whatever they ended up talking about, it worked. Now, I know um, Justin Pennick put out a video in which he tried to present video evidence that Dable was calling the plays and kudos to Justin Pennick, by the way, of talking giants for doing that. I thought that was, that was really, you know, well done on his part, but the whole thing with Dable covering his mouth could just be, you know, if somebody zooms in on you with a good pair of binoculars and is really good with lip rating and you find that, you know, on a lot of staff, some people, some coaches do have people who are, shall we say, lip reading specialists um, who can kind of zoom in and figure out what, what's being said. So, you know, that's why, you know, you might see Wink Martindale put the, the microphone literally in front of his mouth so that you cannot see what his lips are saying. It's an old tactic that a lot of coaches use because, again, somebody with a good pair of, micro, uh, good pair of uh, binoculars can zoom in and try to make sense of what you're saying uh, by reading lips. So. I don't think that, you know, Dable basically took over the play calling. I do think he leaned into the headset and got a little bit more involved in what was going on, as is his right, like I said, as is his job. And you know what? It worked. The Giants season, you know, you can argue this if you want, but it was on the line after that first half of football. If the Giants had lost to the Cardinals, that wouldn't have been good. That would not have been good. So something had to be done. And, you know, Dable is not one to kind of, you know, sit back on his hands and, and just, you know, not take action. He took action what, what, when it was necessary. But at the same time, he didn't um, micromanage, so to speak. They had a discussion and they went forward from that. Now, you know, the, the interesting thing is you've got to remember with the play calling, there's what, 40 seconds or something like that in between plays. And then the, the radio between the sideline and the quarterback's helmet shuts off, I think about 15 seconds in or something like that. So there's not a whole lot of time necessarily for Dable and, and, and Kafka to have a conversation about what play they're going to use next. And for Dable to, you know, dive head first in and, and take over the play calling means that now he's maybe not paying as close attention 
to the rest of the game, which he needs to be doing. So I just think it was more of a consultation role, if you will. And from the selection or the direction of the playbook that maybe they were thinking of doing, you know, that they had worked on that maybe they hadn't gotten to from there, Kafka was picking what the giants did or, or what to call on offense and then leaving it up to Daniel Jones to, you know, audibleize as necessary. So that's how I see it. You know, I, I don't know if I'm right on this, but, uh, you know, I, I really would be surprised if Dable just totally told Kafka, hey, go hit the showers, kid. I'm taking over the play calling moving forward. I, I just don't think that was the case. So my two cents, you know, um, I don't think there's anything to see here because, again, a head coach should be able to lean in to his headset and overrule plays that, you know, he doesn't think are working or philosophies or directions that are just going nowhere. That's what a head coach is getting paid to do amongst other things. So that's what I think happened with the giants on the sideline. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this edition of the locked on giants podcast. As always, thank you for tuning in and uh, keep it here all week. We will have shows the rest of the week for you. So I'll see what I have for you tomorrow. It's either going to be an interview I'll just come up with maybe something something else that might be of interest to you. I have another idea if I don't get the interview, but uh, we'll see what comes up. Then, of course, crossover Thursday. Then we'll review the game, and then we'll send you into a nice long weekend. So until tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you tomorrow.